Hi, well, we're back for part two of our review and critique of your best shot project. By the way, I got a comment on the voice in the first one. I have a horrible allergic sinus attack, so I am very stuffed up, and that's why it sounds that way. I apologize for it. I hope you can understand me. But in the meantime, until that goes away, you're kind of stuck with the voice that I've got left, and we'll get on with what we're doing here. Here we go. Okay, here's our first shot for our part two. An interesting shot of the person pouring syrup without looking. Boy, she's pretty good. She's getting it right in the middle of the butter without even looking down. Is this Zen um, syrup pouring? Like Zen archery, where you shoot through paper walls without seeing the target. And if so, this is this is pretty special. The only thing I would suggest in shots like this, again, like we did in that first fountain shot from the other part, is use a shallow depth of field so this background goes softer and it's not as distracting with all the lights and the other bodies. And I think we can do this one again fairly quickly. We'll make our uh, duplicate layer. We'll go down on the bottom one, go to filter, blur, and again we'll use the Gaussian blur but just because it's fast. Add a little to it. Oop, that's too much. We'll say OK. Go back to our top layer. Make it a layer mask and with a black brush. We'll blur this out. Now because this brush is only set to 47%, we can have a lot of control over how blurry that background becomes. We'll take it down to about there. Now we'll switch to our black brush. Make it small so we can stay right on the edges of our sharp. We make it small so we can stay on the edges of our sharp part. And now we can really concentrate on our little pancake syrup pourer um, a whole lot better. I would probably crop this just a little bit now that I'm seeing it. We need pretty much all of this side, but we could come down here. Maybe come in just a little. That's going to give us a little more of that lean, a little more dynamic tension there. There we go. Now we can really concentrate on what's happening. All we did was pretty subtle. I would also get rid of this area. And I would do that very simply. I'd go into my clone. Well, I'm going to need to flatten it to do this. So let's go layer. Flatten. Clone stamp. If I hold down the Alt or Option key, you can see the cursor change. Now that's what I'm picking up that's going to be stamped wherever I paint. And now I've gotten rid of that distraction. All right. Interesting shot. I love the detached look on her face. It's almost like she's a robot that's going to do this, that is just so positionally aware that she's not required to look at anything she's doing. She can just do it. This is robo 
pancake pourer. Very fun. What a nice shot. Okay, on to the next one. Well, here we have a uh, coffee shop. I'm guessing, you know, it took me a while looking at this to realize there's actually a person in it. It is so busy. I didn't see this person over here. Now, I don't know whether that's a good thing or a bad thing, depending on what it is you want to say. We do have some really confusing edges, like here, where there's almost a false edge that then goes to dark. It's really a very busy, very confusing shot. We would need to know the purpose um, for this. It, it's hard to tell what the real subject is. Even if we crop this a little bit to get rid of that misleading edge, that does help a little. But it's still pretty busy. Um, I might open it up a little to try to pull out some detail here. But more detail simply adds more confusion to it. So I'm not really sure. What I'd suggest is decide, what is your picture about? If it's about the barrister here doing their thing, then we really need to go concentrate on them. If it's about the idea that they're working alone at night, doing this all by themselves with nobody around, then again, I would concentrate my light more, more over here and darken this area more um, to again concentrate on that person and to show them isolated in a pool of light against this darker background. So there are other things we could try to do to this, uh, but I'm not sure where to go from here. It is an interesting concept, but it's unresolved at the moment. So let's go to the next one. Oh, what a fun picture of the little girl in her, what is this, her confirmation uh, dress? Very clever idea to use the girl and the mirror together. Um, it works really pretty well. It's too bad that the, the real person here isn't just a little bit closer to the reflected person. We could make that happen a little bit, you know. Oh, yeah, you say? Well, let's see if we can make this happen. So I made a selection. I'm now going to put it on the clipboard. And I'm going to do a copy and paste, but I'm going to do it with the keyboard. So the first step is I'm going to hit Control or Command C, which copies it. And then I'll hit Control or Command V for Victor, which then pastes it onto a new layer. And you can see I've now got two layers here. Now what I can do with the Move tool is I can move this new layer closer. I could use a layer mask for this, but I'm just going to use the eraser tool since it's handy. And I'm going to come in here to pick up this little bit of the back of the chair that I just covered. Going to need more than 27%. And now we'll do a final crop. And now we've connected those two uh, characters, the real and the reflected, um, a little bit better. So when you're putting dual subjects, it's like putting two people in a shot. They need to be connected somehow. What we could also do is simply have cut the reflected person out and brought her over m much further to fit, fit 
closer to this and made that connection a little better. It would have been a lot more work. I'm going to do this real quickly. I'm not going to try to be very precise with this, but I'm going to show you what we could have done. Boy, talk about not precise. Now I'm going to move her to where her elbow was just a little over that mirror. And then I'm going to set this up to 100% so I can try to be a little faster with this. If I were trying to be, uh, do this for real, I would need to be more precise. Do this with a much smaller brush. Fortunately, since she's a little out of focus, I can do this and let that edge be soft. And nobody's going to notice it much. I can use the X key to bring to change colors of the brush. Now what I could do is really make this A whole lot tighter and start to really put those two parts together so with Photoshop if you can imagine it you can pretty much do it so learn to really think out of the box when you're putting stuff like this together you can create some amazing things with it so let's do another one. Oh, isn't that a cute little dog sitting there looks like he's trying to figure out what the heck you're doing um, and again, where's our picture in here? Where's the photograph in here? I would suggest that it's right here with the face and the uh, expression of the animal. What does this material over here, what does it really tell us about the uh, animal? I'm going to suggest it doesn't tell us anything. So I would come in and make the picture about what it's supposed to be about, which is the dog. And let us really see that face. Then you could vignette this a bit so that the lighter color background, which blends almost perfectly into the lighter color of the dog, isn't quite as bright, and the dog really stands out more. I think that would help it enormously. But let's move on. Oh, another doggy shot. And once again, we've got the color really works with the color of the dog and the color of the sidewalk and the bricks and the, the ground and everything. It's a good selection of palettes. It does look like it's crooked, like the, the axis of the dog is not straight up and down. So maybe, I don't know, maybe there's an earthquake going on or this thing is built on a hillside and the dog has an extraordinary degree of balance, a lot of ballast in its feet. But once again, I think your shot is here. 
it's nice to put all this in. It's nice to say, oh, well, now I'm going to put all this color together. But in the photograph, what you've basically done is confuse us as to what's really the subject. So, once again, I would come in on it. And because the dog is so strongly vertical. And make the shot about the dog, not about the sidewalk or the yard. If it were truly about the yard and not the dog, then we can include a whole lot more of the yard and just make the dog a smaller element in it, like one more brick or one more flower pot or something else in it. But here, it's there's so much real estate devoted to the yard um, that in a, um, a de facto sense, that becomes what the shot's about. Another doggy. Oh, look at this poor, poor creature. What on earth has happened to this poor dog? Oh, my God. Wow. But again, this little face, this and this, these cones, I know these are mandatory to keep dogs from scratching at things, like in this case, probably the bandages and other things, but oh god, they are, they're so awful, they, you know the poor dog just hates this, so it's, um, it's an interesting, interesting shot, but again, what does this tell you, what does the grass tell you about this shot, that you let the dog out, no, oh, wow, that doesn't say anything about the dog or its condition, it's a cute blanket on it, Maybe it's cold out and the dog needs to be uh, bundled up a little. But if that's the case, then let's make it about the dog. How much of that cone do we need in order to tell us what's going on? Maybe not all that much. And now what we could do is, and I'm just going to do this with the uh, burn tool because it's faster, is we could darken this background so it's not as prominent in the picture. And then with a bigger brush. It'll make you really concentrate on the dog's face. So you can see it all a little better. Okay? It makes me sad. What on earth happened to this poor dog? Wow. Oh, this is a very nice, very nice abstract um, shot with a very oriental flavor to it. Looks like some of the uh, oriental art or paintings uh, that we'll see now and then. Now, this is strong enough with this line in the background, with these things. It purely becomes a matter of style, really, as to whether we'd make any changes. Where at mine, I find this to be a lot of empty space, but on the other hand... That has a message of its own, and that could be part of the story of this, of this painting that just happens to be done as a photograph. I would, uh, I'm going to leave this pretty much alone and leave it just as it is. I think it's very interesting. It'd be nice if the berries were just a little bit brighter in it, but that's really being picky. I'm, I think I'm going to leave this alone. It's a nice job. Nice image. Let me go on. Oh, and here's our last one for this part two of the series. A shot of someone's uh, backyard or patio or wherever this is. Again, this has a lot of, lot of stuff in it. It's a very, very busy shot. 
Where is the photograph in here? When I look around it, for my eye, I'm seeing it all in here, where all of these parts intersect. So that would be my, my guess as to where the, the shot really is. And the first thing I would do in order to get that uh, as part of my shot is, again, crop it. Decide this is really critical for you guys. Nobody else is going to be able to figure out where your real shot is if you don't help them. If you're going into a festival or a juried competition, this is critical. I am have been a juror at the fair since 2001 and at every judges panel over and over and over you'll hear the judges say something to the effect of you the photographer you the photographer need to point out where the photo in your photo is it's not our job to find it for you and pretend as if that's what you presented us it's not their job. So is it in here? Is this a better view of it? Do you need this particular plant to add some elements to it? Well, that's another option. In which case, then maybe what we need to do is get rid of that phone pole. Maybe what we needed to do is move around where you're shooting more this way and maybe even more up so you've dropped this building down behind the wall and can't even see it. There are all kinds of options for making this a little better. And we also need to bring out this foreground just a little. So I'm going to do that in our typical way using a, a screen layer. Actually, I'm not bothered by having that background almost die out. But we've got a whole lot more information here. Maybe all we need to do is bring this exposure back just a little. And then if we ended up taking that, let me bring back a little bit of some of these tones and then try something with it. I'm going to show you something you could do that would be unbelievably tedious to do, but it would get rid of a lot of the distractions of things. And I'm not going to do the whole picture that way because it would be here all day. But I'm going to flatten this first. Over here where the Band-Aid is, there is a function... called a spot healing tool, spot healing brush tool. And what this allows you to do is something almost magical. If I want to get rid of these lines, all I have to do is paint over them. Sometimes you have to do it a couple of times to get rid of it totally. Of course, we need a black brush to be doing this. You could then go through and pick up the sky and completely obliterate this fence. You could at least get rid of some of this distraction. Again, it's going to be uncommonly tedious to pull that off. But it could be done. could be done. Like I said before, in Photoshop, if you can imagine it, you can pretty much do it once you find the way, once you learn the techniques. Okay, that's pretty much it for this critique of your uh, best shot. 
So I'll be looking forward to seeing the next assignment, the depth of field assignment. And until that comes in, I hope you have some fun and this was helpful to you. And we'll talk to you later. Bye.